Chris Allen. I'm the director of Dare County Arts Council, and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, to be here for the performance of Brothers Like This, uh, Brothers Like These, a stage reading of poetry by Vietnam veterans from Western North Carolina. Uh, before we get started, I do want to thank some of our sponsors. Um, we had tremendous outpouring of support for hospitality for these folks who came all the way from Asheville. Um, the North Carolina Arts Council provided grant money for us to rent a bus to bring them all here in style. Um, uh, Jane Webster, the Hilton Garden Inn, Keys Vacations, the Nags Head Inn, uh, and um, uh, they all provided rooms for these guys, uh, but the uh, the one company that really stepped up the most was the Corolla Village Inn, who just opened and provided eight rooms, uh, uh, you know, right before Memorial Day, which was a tremendous gift. Uh, in addition, Matt Broughton from uh, Low Tide Bar and Grill, he also owns Cosmos, uh, fed all of them for free today. So I, I assume it was a good meal. Uh, it was just, I mean, I, I called and asked him if we get a discount, and he said, no, I'll just feed everybody. So uh, it was just just tremendous to see the uh, amount of support that, that we got um, uh, from the community to bring these guys into town. Um, I would like to introduce Joseph Bethanti, who has worked with these gentlemen over the last several years as they've developed their voice as poets. As many of you know, Joseph Bethanti was the seventh poet laureate appointed by Governor Bev Perdue in 2012. He's also a professor at Appalachian State University an award-winning poet, author of several books of poetry, and he's become one of our best friends here in Dare County. We've had him down several times, and we hope to hear, uh, hope to see him here uh, more, as we hope to see all of these gentlemen come back and, and visit us as much as they'd like to. So please uh, warmly welcome Joseph Bethanti. Hey everybody, um, you know I'll end up repeating what I said just a few minutes ago. But before I do that, just a couple of things. Could, could, be, and before I forget, can I, can I ask you to please turn off your cell phones? Um, also, I was asked to announce that there are restrooms at the back of the building behind us, behind at the back of the town hall. And, and the other thing is, um, the brothers will be coming up one right after another to read their individual pieces, and we would ask you if you would hold your applause until the concluding piece, please. I also want to mention that after the performance, the book, Brothers Like These, published by St. Andrews University Press, and it's currently the press's bestseller, will be on sale, and the brothers will be happy to sign your copies. Um, Again, just to reiterate what, what Chris said, the kind of outpouring of hospitality that we've seen coming down here is just extraordinary. Bruce and I and all the brothers and, and plenty of the wives have come with us too. I want to extend our thanks to Chris Sawin and the Dare County Arts Council. Um, you know, you've, you've fed us, you've quartered us, you've provided a bus for us to all travel down together all the way from the western part of North Carolina, which was another incredible experience for all of us to be to, to, to have that, you know, an, an, another level of, of togetherness that we all cherish. And, and I do want to say that I've worked in Dare County on more than one occasion, and that this Arts Council is just one of the fire-breathing Arts Councils in, in the state of North Carolina. And what you do for veterans, nobody does it better. Nobody even comes close to doing what you do for veterans. And you started that right here. And I'm hoping that other Arts Councils in other counties get the picture. And I've been very candid about my praise for the Dare County Arts Council in general, but, but what it does for veterans specifically in Raleigh at the State Arts Council. So thank you more than I can than I can say. When I was appointed North Carolina's Poet Laureate in 2012, I declared that my signature project during my tenure was going to be working with returning combat veterans, all veterans, and their families to harvest their stories through poetry, fiction, nonfiction plays, you name it. 
But at the same time, there were a number of remarkable people across North Carolina doing similar kinds of work. <laughs> One of them was Dr. Bruce Kelly, a primary care physician at the Charles George VA Medical Center in Asheville. In the spring of 2014, I received an email from Bruce discussing his work pioneering medical humanities at the VA in a community-based arts and medicine program, programs that have since transformed the face of what healing looks like for wounded veterans. And I want to point out, too, that Bruce and I have become, over the past five or six years, just really great, great friends in the kind of heroic things that he, he's done for, for veterans, period. Not just these fellows, but just for his panel of patients at the VA has just been remarkable and has set, set the standard for patient care of veterans. Bruce's initial email gave way to others and phone calls, and I'm oversimplifying the, the process, but pretty soon Bruce and I began meeting with veterans at the v Asheville VA where they gathered to write and in January of 2016, through the generosity of the North Carolina Arts Council and the North Carolina Humanities Council, I assumed the role of Charles George VA medical writer in residence. Those writing sessions over the past five years have yielded extraordinary, breathtaking writing. Brothers like these, the book and the performance you're about to see have been twice performed at the Asheville Community Theater at Appalachian State University, performed as well in Franklin, North Carolina, in Old Fort, North Carolina, excerpted at the Carolina Mountains Literary Festival in Burnsville, North Carolina, performed as well at the 2019, just this past March, Vietnam Veterans of America Annual Convention. Brothers Like These has been adapted by a group of Fairview Elementary School students from Buncombe County, North Carolina, who call themselves Kids Like These, into an award-winning production which recently won the Destination Imagination Project Outreach Team Competition, and I do believe as we speak right now, they are in Kansas City with their production competing in another event. <coughs> Some of these veterans have been broadcast across the nation on Veterans Radio, the voice of Americans' veterans out of Ann Arbor, Michigan. While Brothers Like These is a kind of culmination of what went on at the Asheville VA, it's decidedly not the end of the work that these men, with powerful and courageous support from their wives and families engaged in, there's so much more of it, so much more to come. In that room, they've committed to paper the stories that have been banging around inside them, often deviling them since their service in Vietnam. The same stories that have empowered and lifted them, and for which they've discovered language, is one of the fellows represented within these pages, and tonight on stage states with blunt eloquence that still makes me laugh, when asked to participate in this pilot program, we all had the same reservations and doubts about what we were getting ourselves into introducing arts and humanities through poetry to help wounded vets initially sounded like a cockamamie idea. <coughs> this journey has been a catharsis for many of us. It provided us the opportunity ourselves through writing and discussion in a safe, non-judgmental environment that we shared as brothers. We shared our most intimate feelings, fears, recollections, thoughts. We found a voice we didn't know we had and that we weren't alone and that we weren't different. We have all gained something from this experience. Another of the men stated, this is the closest thing to a miracle that's happened in my life. These kinds of testimonies are echoed by each of these men, and I might add corroborated by their wives and children. I've been teaching creative writing now for 42 years, and it's no exaggeration that I've never ever seen writing transform people's lives, as well as the lives of their families the way it has the Vietnam veterans who ventured into Classroom B every Wednesday to commit their hearts and souls, their unforgettable stories to paper. I, I personally, truly, have never been so dramatically changed by a teaching experience in my life, period. 
They started out as sheepish, reluctant writers who are now confident, fire-breathing writers and statesmen who understand the enormous importance of writing programs for veterans and the influence they now wield in helping facilitate similar programs for other veterans. These brothers have been evangelized and now they are doing the evangelizing. It's abundantly clear this work changes lives. It's documented with living, passionate testimony by these veteran writers. They are eyewitness crucibles of change that's been nothing short of miraculous, and I am not trafficking in hyperbole. I use the word miraculous very intentionally. I've said it to the guys, and I won't, it won't hurt to say it here again, and I know I speak for Bruce as well, and also Elizabeth Heaney, a woman who took over for me in the writing classroom to teach alongside Bruce. And I speak, I hope, for everyone in this room who's seen up close the evangelizing power of the arts and humanities and the lives of veterans, and nobody knows it better than the citizens of Dare County. It's been my profound honor and privilege, one that will never dwindle, to spend time in their company, to get to know them not only as unimaginably brave soldiers who gave their all during Vietnam War, but to get to know them as people, to call them friends, to witness a sacred sense of humanity, community, love, and brotherhood develop among them, to hear about and meet their families, to see them dig so deeply with that same courage to find their remarkable voices, to hear their stories, stories not just invaluable to succeeding generations of soldiers, but to every citizen of our country and beyond. Their stories are stories I'll never forget, stories that will travel with me always. They have taught me far more than I could ever teach them. In the words of the poet Jackson Wheeler from his poem, Ars Poetica, which we read as a group in classroom B, words bear witness. My name is Michael Ireland, United States Army, 18 months in Vietnam. My piece is called Service. You took us fresh from being children. You took away everything we had known. You gave us a new family with brothers and sisters. You made us different and gave us a will to protect and defend. You made us warriors, one and all. You placed us in harm's way and asked impossible things of us. We sacrificed, adapted, overcame, and delivered. And when we were done, you tried to dismantle the warriors you had forged. You took away everything, our new life, our brothers and sisters. You told us one and all, thank you for your service. You put us back into the world you had taken from us. But it was different. We were different. And then it was done, but not forgotten. Name is Alan Brickell, United States Air Force, Vietnam 67 to 68. Where I'm from to where I was destined to be. It's dedicated to those who didn't return and those who returned different. I grew up in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, the birthplace of America, first generation of immigrant parents from Poland who escaped the Holocaust, leaving their family behind. My first car was a 55 Chevy. Music was a beat I grew up to, rock and roll of the 50s, record hops, dancing in the streets. I remember 1960, 13 years old on Roosevelt Boulevard in Philly, the motorcade going by with John F. Kennedy, the future president of the United States. Ask not what you can do for your country, but what your country can do for you. I ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I'm sorry. So at the age of 18, with no clear direction in my life, and thinking back to what Kennedy had said, I joined the Air Force in 1965. The time had come for me to give back to my country what it gave to my parents, freedom and an opportunity for a life without persecution. I trained as a medic in early 1967, knowing the Vietnam War was in full operation, I volunteered to go. My memory of the two weeks or so leave back home in Philly, May of 67, is a complete blur. 
no girlfriend to say goodbye to. What was clear is that the unknown was about to become known. I jumped on an airplane from Philly to San Francisco, young and innocent, at the age of 20. Awaiting the flight at Travis Air Force Base, I could see troops in full combat gear spread out on the floor. Their faces told the story, the thousand-yard stare. Raw, unapproachable, they had just come back from Vietnam. What was in their heads? What had they seen and done? On the airplane, the final stop is where I entered the twilight zone. Do not attempt to adjust your set. This is the outer limits, Vietnam. There's no turning back. The heat and smell welcome you to Southeast Asia. 1967 and 1968 in Vietnam, more than 50 years ago, would forever be remembered as a place and time where I would learn about the meaning of life taught to me by the combat wounded I took care of, and more than the 58,000 names inscribed on the granite wall in Washington, D.C. Every breath of life is a gift. Cherish them all, for you never know when your last one will be. We who served in that war forged a brotherhood that will live on for eternity, together then, together again. My name is Ed Norris, United States Marine Corps, served in Vietnam in 1967. Where I'm from, I was born in 1947 in a company house in West Virginia, cold country, in a place called Summerlee, where everyone knew your business. The house sat on top of a hill. It was brown, like one of those old wooden barns. There were three floors and a little kitchen. What wonderful food and smells came from there. For the first six years of my life, I went to an all-black, one-room school where the teacher stood you up in front of the class and beat you, then sent a note home to your parents, and you got another beating. We were Baptists, and then every Sunday and Wednesday we would be in church. My dad worked in the coal mine, played baseball on the weekends, and cut hair. He sold moonshine in the 40s and early 50s. We were expected to work. I, did, I delivered newspapers to the white community. In spring, we would prepare the ground for seeds and set out strawberries. Late fall, we would pick coal to get ready for the winter. Then we moved to a new town, another company house. There were six houses, a church, and a one-room school. We lived one house away from the church and 200 yards from the school. In 1956, they integrated the West Virginia schools. We had to go to the white schools. I walked through the coal mine to get there. Men came out of the mine, everyone was black. We had coal burning stoves. In 1958, there were six of us children, two boys and four girls. I came from a family that was wild, drinking, dancing, partying, playing cards, until my father got hurt in the mine and he couldn't work there anymore. Everything changed after that. In 1962, we moved again. This time, it was like to the city. There were girls everywhere. Every time we moved, there was a Baptist church a few houses away. I joined the Marine Corps on the last day of June in 1965 on what they called the 120-day plan. I was sent to California where we played war games in a village that looked like Vietnam. We were told not to fire our weapons until we were fired upon. We trained day and night. In June of 1967, it was time to go to Vietnam. I didn't feel like we were going to war. I felt that I was going to war on people I didn't know and had no understanding of. I didn't know anyone I was traveling with. 
I had left my platoon back at Camp Lejeune. I was kept in the dark all the way to Vietnam. I'm not sure where I landed in the country. I didn't have a rifle. We were told we would get our orders the next day. For the first night, we had hand grenades in case the enemy overran us. I had a hard time going to sleep. The next morning at 5.05, bombs went off. It went on for about five to 10 minutes. It was so nice to see the sun come up. I was told to get on the helicopter. We flew to the ship, and on the ship, I was given an M16 rifle, but it wouldn't fire until I cleaned the blood off of it. Stephen Henderson, United States Marine Corps, Indy Company 3-4, I-Corps. The day before I left home, my last day before leaving home was spent at my family's house, at my grandparents' house. It had orange carpet, and my wife and I slept in the extra bedroom. We had spent my 30-day leave together. I'd depart the next day for survival training in California. After that, I was headed to Vietnam to the war. My grandparents' house was beside the French Broad River, a familiar place I loved. I woke up not wanting to let go of my wife. She was pregnant with my daughter, which made it even harder to leave. It was early spring and the birds were singing. My mind raced. I had just lost my best friend two months earlier in Vietnam. My wife and mother were upset, knowing I was going to war. My grandfather, the only man in my life, was upset that I joined the Marines. My wife and I got up to fix breakfast. My family was coming to buy to wish me goodbye. My grandfather's dog was on one side of me, my wife on the other. I talked to my mother about selling my 1968 Camaro SS 350. Le Mans blue with a black vinyl top. It was my first new car. I wanted to make sure my wife and my new daughter had money. I was worried about them and my mother. We had a great breakfast, but it reminded me of the Last Supper. I asked my wife to walk out to the French Broad River with me. We talked a lot about how things would be when I returned. The river was muddy and running swiftly over the rocks. Hi, I'm George Durden, U.S. Army, 71, 72 in Vietnam, and the title of my piece is Arrival. On our last leg of 24 hours of travel to Vietnam, ended with us landing at Benoit Air Force Base. We were all glued to the windows, trying to see something that resembled war. <laughs> Sitting with uh, nervous anticipation for getting off the plane, the door finally opened and oh my God, the smell. I soon discovered it was a smell of human waste mixed with diesel being burnt and cut down 55 gallon drums. Indoor plumbing was few and far between, so multi-home outhouses, or multi-hole outhouses, with these burrows were used to catch a waste, then routinely burned, and I've never forgotten that smell. We were ushered into a hangar, escorted by armed soldiers holding their weapons, dressed in full combat gear, that we didn't know whether it was to let us know it is real and gets game on or just for security. After a short group briefing on the bleachers, we began processing that included the review of our administrative paperwork, similar to what we had just completed at Fort Dix. Since I had carried all my records with me, I thought to myself, come on people, how many times do I need to review my religious preference? <laughs> my, my next of kin, my life insurance beneficiary, blood type, it hadn't changed since I left Dick's. Then the medical review. Sure hope there are more shots, or no more shots, especially with the air gun. 
But hey, fate had to intervene, and we got the buttocks hammer slammer peanut butter shot, the Gambia Globlin. You know. <laughs> I was sure I had received it, and it was annotated in my most valued document, the shot record. But my argument fell on deaf ears, and I was told it's for my own good. Thanks, Doc. That makes me feel so much better. Later that night, we loaded on two buses for Long Bend Replacement Center, which served as the embarkation point to the various units in Vietnam. The bus had bars and chicken wire over the windows, like you'd expect on a prison bus. The modification we were told was necessary to prevent grenades from being tossed into the bus. The long ride through ben, Long Bend City was terrifying. The driver was pedaled to the metal, damn anyone that got in his way. More than once, a small child wandered out to the roadside to see the buses. Their presence was way too close for my comfort, and I wonder why parents would allow such small children to do this. Upon arrival to the replacement center, we were assigned barracks, and we were told to settle in for the night. We were welcomed to our barracks by numerous huge cockroaches scurrying around the floor, on beds, and up the walls. After we got them on the floor, we did a similar Mexican hat dance to get rid of them. There was outgoing artillery along with mortar or hand launch flares or both lighting the perimeter on during the night. We speculated that there were incoming rockets, but being newbies had not yet learned the unique sound they make. A bunch of us were unable to sleep, so we sat for hours watching this spectacular spectacle and all as if it was a 4th of July fireworks display, all the while trying to keep our 18-year-old emotions in check. Our stadium seats were a row of 55-gallon drums surrounding the barracks filled with dirt and topped with two layers of sandbags, what we would later learn were placed there to serve as blast barricades. First morning had me waking up to Reveille watching rats the size of cats running around the rafters. It was later within my tour while eating lunch with a hooch mate, I learned they could be tasty. Just had to eat with my tasters, not my eyes or mine, and to take the first bite. The first bite, interestingly, was made possible having eaten wonder meat that was regularly served in a chow hall. You wonder what it was, water buffalo, beef, or something else. Thank God for hot sauce. I'm Ed Spangler, United States Marine Corps, Vietnam 1968-69. This is titled Because I Didn't Want to Know Names. We flew over on a C-130 cargo plane, sitting in nylon sling seats, swaying back and forth. With our helmets on, our backpacks on, my M-14 was upright between my knees, banging thigh to thigh. None of us talked. It was noisy, loud anyway. I was sick, too. We landed February 14, 1968, in the middle of Tet. I passed out in the channel line and came to three days later in a hospital tent. They said I had pneumonia. Because of that, I was separated from my unit and sent north with other reinforcements to Quezon. I was assigned to Delta Company, 1st Battalion, 9th Marines. Several years earlier, our battalion had been able to penetrate into a valley 15 miles south of Da Nang, an area the Japanese and the French had been unable to do. In the spring of 1966, Ho Chi Minh, in a speech to his people, named this battalion D. Bo Chet, the Walking Dead. His commanding general had promised to take back the valley by Ho Chi Minh's birthday. Needless to say, that did not happen. So the Wen Nine was a big thorn in their ass. The Ho Chi Minh swore to wipe us out. They had Hanoi Hannah on their radio say, and for you boys in The Walking Dead, she played Martha Reeves and the Vandellas, nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Our battalion endured the longest sustained combat and highest killed in, in action rate in Marine Corps history. The 1-9 was engaged in combat for 47 months. We sustained casualties of 3,645 wounded, 748 killed in action, and two MIAs. 
The average infantryman in the South Pacific in World War II saw about 40 days of combat in four years. In Vietnam, the average inf infantryman saw 240 days in one year, thanks to the mobility of the helicopter. I saw so many young men killed from mortars, rockets, firefights, ambushes, hot LZ landings. At first, you made friends. You got close to the men in your squad. You depended on each other, only to see them blown apart, dying, and your arms are at your feet looking up at you, asking, am I going to make it? And having to lie, yeah, you're going to make it. <laughs> I saw so many young men's lives wasted. It got so bad after some months over there that I was able to tell if the new replacements were going to make it through or not. I got to where I didn't want to know them or get close because it hurt so much to lose someone you were close to. It was that bad. I didn't want to know names. My name is Butch Gudger, uh, United States Marine Corps. Uh, Vietnam, 69 and 70. First Recon Battalion. The name of my, pay, my piece is a person like me. We were coming up the side of a hill. We were hot and sweaty and exhausted from the climb. Our whole focus had been to survive the mountain, not be seen or heard by the enemy. We wanted to be cooler. We were not. We were supposed to be quiet. We were not until the end of the climb. On top of the mountain, we came out of the forest into tall elephant grass. As we began beating down brush, we came across a visible trail. It was a sign that the enemy was using this place as a way to move between camps. We knew that contact could happen at any time. From boredom to sheer terror, in a millisecond, Suddenly, the point man opened up with a burst of fire and a grenade. He'd made contact, surprising the enemy. As the patrol moved forward, we found one enemy soldier dead. There were two we couldn't find, only a trail of blood leading further away. We began to search the dead for soldier, soldiers for weapons and papers we stuffed into our gear. He had been carrying an AK-47, magazines of ammunition for it. As the two of us searched the body, the rest of the team took up positions around us for protection. I found a brown leather-like wallet, small by our standards. Inside was a paper with Vietnamese writing on it, as well as a couple of pictures. What had him with his mother and father and what I thought was a sister. It was an old brownish photograph, fuzzy and worn. There was also a picture of a girl, assumed to be his wife or girlfriend. I took the wallet and the photographs and tucked them into my pocket. After we gathered all we could, could the report came back that there were no further NVA to be seen, so we moved into the tree line and regrouped. I left one of our calling cards on the dead so, soldier so his comrades would find it. It was the size of a playing card, it had eyes on it and said in Vietnamese, the eyes of recon are upon you. We wanted to know them to know they were being watched. It was a routine for us to leave. We were extracted the next day with no further contact with the enemy. But what stayed me with me was the person we killed was just like us or just like me. A living person with a mother a father, a sister, a girlfriend. While he was not, while he was our enemy, meaning we had to either kill or be killed, he was not an animal or a machine or a monster. This was a person just like me. Charles Erskine, Army. It wasn't a tiger. K Company Rangers are going out on a mission in the morning. We're packing lerps and sea rations. Always a scuffle over the peaches and pound cake. We go out in six-man teams for three days and nights. It's late in the day, 
So we set up for the night in a circle, five meters apart, space so they can't kill more than one. Five meters is the killing radius of a hand grenade. We put claymores out around and run wires back to us. We hook the claymores to batteries and clackers. Then we eat and it gets dark. We take turns staying awake, one hour and 30 minutes. It's triple canopy jungle, so dark you can put your hand a half inch from your face and you can't see it. I do my turn and wake up the guy to my left. We are lying feet out. I go to sleep. I wake up, my legs and feet are asleep from my knees down. In a whisper, I tell the guy I woke up that something's on me. He says, in a whisper, it's my imagination. I say, in a whisper, no, there's something laying on my legs. I can feel it. He says, I must have my legs under a root. I say, I cleaned my place out and there wasn't anything down there that was as big as this feels. About that time, there's this growling sound. The guy I woke up says in a whisper, it's a tiger, I'm going to shoot it. I say, don't shoot, my legs are down there. <laughs> besides, besides that something, besides that someone snoring, he says, what do you want to do? I tell him to go wake up the person snoring and I'll be thinking. When he comes back, I tell him to take his M16 and I help him put it on my leg, about at my knee, and start down, but make sure the safety is on and to keep his finger away from the trigger. When his 16 gets to what's on my leg, he says he feels something. He asked, what do you want me to do? I tell him to bring his 16 back up my leg and not do anything until I tell him to poke it. I reach down and I get hold of my fatigues above my knees on the side of my legs. I tell him to poke it. He does and I feel something start to drag across my legs in a zigzag motion. I jerk my legs to my face. I sit there expecting something to grab me. I don't know how long I sit there. My buddy goes back to his position. After a while, I stretch my legs back out, still expecting something to grab me or something to happen. Nothing did. I go to sleep. David Roselle, music from the sky. We all knew it was Christmas Eve. No one mentioned it. There was no resupply helicopter with mail due for a couple of days. There were no presents, no cards. The chaplain held special services at base camps, but we were in the jungle, a short terminal trip from anywhere. The company broken up into eight-man ambush teams for the night. We sat down in heavy brush to eat supper and wait for twilight so we could move safely into our ambush site. The site we were assigned was a newly cut road as wide as I-95 into Florida. It left me more than a little uneasy. There was no pavement and no tracks or prints to indicate recent heavy traffic, but the ghosts were around. We placed our mechanical ambush devices and armed the deadly things. We formed a tight circle with some new growth elephant grass, maybe 18 inches tall, for concealment and protection. The anxiety surrounding this campsite pushed thoughts of my other family back home, gathered around a warm fireplace, exchanging gifts to a back burner. It was a cloudless night. 
There was enough moon to light up the area, and I got to sleep in good order. When my guard shift started at midnight, I got quickly oriented, decided which direction was most likely to produce enemy activity, and then settled into a routine of classifying and organizing the night sounds and sights. At 12.41, I heard the prop noise of a helicopter. It didn't take long to find the form of a lone chopper moving high and slowly across the sky in front of me. The helicopter was well past me when I heard its mission for the night. From a strong speaker on board the plane came music. The first tune was Silent Night. All the emotions I'd stacked up so high and deeply and neatly on that back burner fell heavily on the tinfoil protecting those soft spots. I'm sure the officer in charge of the music mission had good intentions, and I hope the songs brought warmth to the other soldiers in the area, but I could have done without it. Wayne Heflin, U.S. Army, First Field Force, Vietnam, 1969. The title, Crystal Blue Persuasion. It's daybreak. 20 trucks with supplies and ammo line up, <coughs> ready for the 60-mile journey. There's an armed jeep in front and one in the rear. Spread throughout this convoy are the rocks, or what we know as the Republic of Korean soldiers. They have a free fire zone and can shoot at anything, anytime, anywhere. However, the American soldiers are very restricted. We are ordered then by Captain B to move out with his command. I then position myself behind the 60 caliber machine gun. I was carrying 245 pistols, a Thompson machine gun, non-issue, I had traded two cartons of Salem cigarettes for in a village and one ammo box loaded with grenades. The first 15 miles of this trip are through small villages located in the no-fire zone. That's why the rocks, Republic of Korea, are with us. That rule simply does not apply to them. As we track through these roadside villages, we observe the Mama Sons, the Papa Sons, the Baby Sons for possible danger. So they're dressed in black silk pajamas, small children not knowing there's a war on, smile with those rotten teeth and wave excitedly as we pass by them. Suddenly, there is an instant halt of this convoy. All of a sudden, radio communication between the front jeep, the rear jeeps. Captain B announces there's a lockdown, meaning the rocks remain on full alert with quad 50 caliber machine guns. Captain B gets out of his Jeep and wanders up and down the convoy, announcing the engineers ahead of us have got hit and that we could be delayed for hours. Now there's Collins, my longtime friend and Jeep driver and I decide to unload, which was foolish, and walk into a roadside village a few yards away. We discover, much to our delight, an old hooch, like a roadside drive-in diner, a very small space, and it reeks of garbage, boiling rice, but it was just a family business. The mama son, the papa son, the baby son, 
All three of them were just sitting there squatting and smiling. So dead, right dead in the middle of this diner was a 55-gallon drum of diesel fuel. And it was loaded with Slitz beer. That's how you cool beer without ice. Collins and I grab a couple of gasoline chill beers, wipe the gas and the fumes off. I take out my rusty keychain and trusty church key, which has been hanging around my neck for 10 months, attached to my dog tags, and pop two delicious slits beers at seven o'clock in the morning. We flip old Papa San some funny money, and he just smiles with those rotten teeth. Oh, the sound of a church key opening a frosty beer can. It's a joy for both Collins and myself. As we turn up our beers, Collins turns and he looks over at me, and I look over at him, and both of us are thinking, do you see what I see, or is this just a mirage? Yes, there is the king and the queen of jukeboxes, the Wurlitzer Art Deco rainbow lit jukebox. Its lights are on. So we carefully approach this jewel like a new shiny Corvette. So we look into its glass window, and there's a listings of all the songs that I had left behind. But there are no records visible, no records to match the faded cards in the window. Yet hidden at the bottom of this fine piece of jewelry is one record. Collins and I waste no time. We punch the keys and bingo, the sweet sound of Tommy James and the Shondells Crystal Blue Persuasion. So for the next hour, we listened over and over and over to Crystal Blue Persuasion and drank hot beer in the company of a poor South Vietnamese family. As I listen to the music, my, wine, my mind wanders back to the little town, USA, in Kentucky where I'm from. The Sunday afternoon rides with my girlfriend on a highway known as 1613 Lover's Lane, where I had my first kiss, my first drink of Kentucky whiskey, my first drag race, and where I lost my virginity. The smell of the tobacco fields and the sound of those thoroughbred horses come to the edge of the fence to greet me. Those are my memories, like a beautiful dream. Crystal blue persuasion playing in the background as I relive what I love most. And then, like being awakened from a dream, I hear those oh so familiar words from Captain B. It's time to move out. Collins and I slowly walk back to the Jeep crystal blue persuasion playing faintly in the background, and I leave behind our newfound family. There are a million thoughts in my head as I mount the Jeep, and I take my position behind the 60 caliber machine gun. I then take a moment to gather my composure from this remarkable discovery of the crown jewels of jukeboxes. John Hoffman, I served in Vietnam in 1971-1972. My piece is entitled An Enduring Image. 
Upon graduating from Georgetown University in the June of 1969, I was commissioned a second lieutenant in the United States Army. Standing with me was Gary Garzinski, sitting in the audience, commissioned at the same time, who would later fly in the back of my helicopter in Vietnam as a Ford uh, observer for the, for the artillery. Shortly after graduation, I reported to Ranger School. Upon earning my Ranger tab, I was sent to Fort Hood, Texas, where I found myself detailed to the Military Police Corps. Fort Hood in those days was one of the most violent stateside communities in the United States military. Nearly every soldier assigned there was returning from or departing for duty in Vietnam. At Fort Hood, the original drug cartels preyed on young soldiers. Off-post criminal gangs exploited illegal liquor, gambling, and stolen military goods. Newsweek called it Fort Pothead. We averaged one homicide a week while I was there. Every confrontation had the potential for serious injury or death for our MPs. The prevailing political climate led to frequent and sometimes violent protests near the post. By early 1971, I had dealt with violent offenders almost daily. I had discharged my sidearm in the line of duty more often than most American law enforcement officers do an entire career. By 1971, threats to my personal safety meant sleeping with a 45 nearby. I needed a change. The Army needed volunteers to fly helicopters more than it needed experienced MPs. I volunteered knowing I would be trading the risks of duty at Fort Hood for the hazardous nature of combat helicopters and assignment to Vietnam. I'd grown up flying with my dad, an Air Force fighter pilot, who by the way was also in Vietnam the same time I was. Besides, the war in Vietnam was winding down. I figured by the time I completed nine months of pilot training, heck, it would all be over. In 1971, December 1971, I stepped off a World Airways DC-8 jet into the heat, humidity, and noxious smelling air of Benoit Air Force Base near Saigon. Soon I was flying CH-47 helicopters out of Marble Mountain Army Airfield near Da Nang. Every day, I flew over the crash site where my first cousin, George Dewey, had died two years before flying Marine CH-46s. With the onset of the Easter Offensive in 1972, my Chinook unit was stood down and our aircraft transferred to the South Vietnamese Air Force, and I was reassigned to fly slicks, or UH-1 helicopters, on combat assault support to South Vietnamese allies fighting North Vietnamese regular army forces and their Russian advisors in I-Corps. We were in the midst of the first large-scale armored battle since the Korean War, often flying through flak so thick it seemed you could walk across it. The 51 caliber and 57 millimeter AAA fires and the occasional SAM-2 or SA-7 missile fire was so intense, we rarely landed without new ventilation on our aircraft. We found that if we left the doors off while flying in contact, there's less to repair after each mission. One of the few enduring positive images for many of us was the sight of the American flag as we popped up from flying through the treetops to make an approach into a U.S. fire support base along Highway 1 north of Hue, or after flying through the frequent coastal scud clouds returning from a combat mission, break out into the sunlight on final approach into our home base at Marble Mountain Army Airfield and seeing the flag flying above the field headquarters. The American flag has always held special significance for our fighting soldiers. It's more than just a symbol to us. It represents who we are, and at some level for all of us, why we do what we do. But most important, that we fight for each other. My name's James Watts. I'm a U.S. Marine of the 68-71 Vietnam War. My topic is titled TAGS. 1971. I'm placing my military belongings away, but far from being forgotten. In the darkest corner of my walk-in closet, there's a footlocker type box that measures two foot by two foot by two foot. Inside this box are items of my military life, untouched in a lot of years by choice. I picture this young man of only 18 years of age, willing but unknowing of things to come, and in the end, things that you would never want to tell. In this box, as I open slowly, I have personal and private items, a camouflage helmet cover with South Carolina 
in big bold print, M60 machine gun rounds, five or six of them showing their age, dress khakis neatly folded, dress shoes that really need a polish, numerous letters and correspondence from the world back home with imaginary plans and promises of the things we would do if I made it back to the U.S. in one piece. Deeper into the box were other items from the era of the Vietnam War, such as rank insignia, olive drab, caps, and finally, my jungle boots, black with green webbing for ventilation. <coughs> the boots were very worn, but still bear a dog tag threaded through the left boot lace, and close by was a chain with the other dog tag. These, these tags were military issue. Although they were small in size, they gave me a great feeling of pride because of the information they possess. Last name, initial, service number, branch of service, religion, and blood type. This is me, my life, maybe meaning nothing to others, but meaning everything to me. After every combat mission, I would take the time to identify the young soldier who wore his dog tag so special at the north and south portions of my body. I think somehow they helped keep me focused. Just do your job. Don't overthink the situation. Keep alert. Say your prayers daily and hopefully return home, a place that you never thought was so important until you could not be there. Although the time has gone, <coughs> memories rush through my mind and quickly I choose not to remember the box in the darkest corner of my walk-in closet. This piece is called Tiff Allen and is adapted from a letter that that I wrote her being my first granddaughter. About the time you were conceived, I was diagnosed with latent PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder from an almost forgotten time in history, the Vietnam War. Those that were there remember, hence PTSD. I was not a believer of this disorder when I returned from Vietnam. I believe that those who claim to have problems as a result of war had problems before they went off to war. The majority of us were 18 to 22 years of age. What, would, what did we know about life, much less war? 33 years later, when I was 60, I found out how wrong I had been. PTSD was real. I was shocked, and then I was mad. I was mad at everything and everybody because my life had been a lie. I had not been in control. As I looked back on my life, I saw how this disorder had affected my career, my first marriage, and my life, and how it was potentially destroying what I had left. At this point, my life was in a slow spiral into darkness. Then God sent me you. The first time I held you on the day you were born, I felt different. You seemed to radiate peace and calm, and from this position of peace and calm, and without ever saying a word, you taught me about unconditional love, joy, and peace. I found after a couple of months, I had stopped descending into the darkness and was now ascending into the light. You showed me a new path for continuing my journey. 
I have loved you from the day you were born, and I will always love you. You hold an extra special place in my heart for saving me from the darkness and helping me to find the path into the light. You will always be my healing angel. Love, Papa. What healing looks like, my dream, to wake up in the morning after a good night's sleep, to go a day without butterflies in my stomach, to feel safe with my back not to the wall, to love freely and not worry about getting too close, to go a day without pain in my body. To go a day without feeling insecure about who I am. To trust people to be who they say they are. To be less controlling. This is my dream and maybe someday some of these dreams will come true. Until then, I will keep on dreaming and hoping for the best. After all, I'm not the only one going through these things. Brothers like these know what I mean. My dream would be that my brothers and sisters in the military would feel free of their pain, be it physical or mental. Never stop dreaming for the better things to happen. David Robinson, U.S. Army, 1970-71. My piece is titled Across the Sea. What a journey for me to cross the sea, to have known the things that I had to see. First was a man they called a V.C., and he was trying to kill me. All the training they gave as best they could, but it was much different across the sea. Things I had never seen, names I had never heard nor could say. Long Bend, Da Nang, Cameron Bay, Chulai, and many more. Frag, M79, M60, Claymores, sea rations, gunship, choppers, far base, NVA. This was so different across the sea, especially for a country boy like me. Names of things like dust off, evacuation hospital, amputation, KIA, medevac. How those names scared me, cause I knew there would be names of comrades, friends, buddies, and yes, brothers, <clears throat> I would never see again. How sad. We didn't have time to weep or mourn. We had to stay alert and on guard and pray there would be no more. There came the day I could go back over the sea what a welcome sight this was going to be. Back to a land I call home. They would be so glad to see me. But when we landed on shore, there were people who acted like they don't like me anymore. I heard names I had never heard before. Warmonger, baby killer, and more. I thought, no, I'm back across the sea. These things should be familiar to me. Then I thought, I'll forget it all. So I hid the reminders, the pictures, the uniforms, the Ho Chi Minh sandals, all the rest. I'll not talk of all I've been through, so it will go away. But the memories and dreams, they stayed. And I started feeling I'm the only one this way. In 30 years or so, I heard about a reunion. At first, I thought, I don't want to go, but I decided I would, and so glad I did. It was mind-boggling, too hard to explain. 
all these brothers, and we all felt the same. How could I ever forget brothers like these? To meet their families, what a joy. And remember, we met when we were just boys. To talk of the good times we had, and very seldom speak of the bad. I think of what would my life be if I'd never had to cross the sea. But if I had not, then I would have never have met brothers like these.